Ladies and gentlemen, chess is a difficult game. You and I both know that. Sometimes you're watching some of these super grandmasters or computers playing, and you're like, wow, it's a mix of art, science, cu curiosity, and fascination. But the same can be applied to games played by 700s. And that is the purpose of today's video. Shout out to David from Poland who sent me this game. This is one of the most incredible uh, just games of chess that I have ever seen in my life. Uh, and I hope the same will go for you once you uh, get into the moves here with me. The setting, uh, we are in the chess.com pool uh, and uh, there's lots of sharks swimming around. This battle between two 700s. I got nothing else to say, here we go. E4. Black responds with G6. This is the modern defense. The idea is to play bishop to G7. Perhaps black is a proud owner of the Gotham G6 course, which I recommend against E4, D4, C4, any of white's first moves. Um, but it became very clear to me that on move three, uh, our friend from Poland uh, definitely is not the owner of a Gotham uh, G6 course because here they play E5. Now, uh, E5 uh, fundamentally at this point doesn't make much sense because white controls the center with two different pieces. Uh, it would make a little bit more sense to play on the sixth rank, generally a G6 bishop and uh, G G6 and bishop on G7 want to fight for the center a little bit more slowly. This is just a clean blunder of a pawn. If you wanted to play E5, you might as well do it on the the first move. So e5, uh, white responds with taking. Now, this is not the worst thing in the world if you immediately go after this pawn. So something like knight c6, queen e7, in the style of the England gambit played after uh, d4, e5, and you just try to win the pawn back like that. But what you should not do after the pawn is taken is to offer up another pawn. That does not make sense because pawn can just take the pawn. And white uh, has emerged from the opening with a clear pawn advantage. Uh, this bishop is open for some tactical opportunities, but the position is very good for white. This is known as a backwards pawn. It's when a pawn has no neighbors uh, or the neighbors are in front of it and it cannot go forward because the square in front of it is controlled. So this is a great move, knight to c3, not allowing the knight to develop. Black responds in turn with knight to c6 and white has a very uh, difficult decision here to make. It's very rare in chess that all four moves with the bishop make sense. All of them. Uh, so white plays bishop b5. I don't hate that move. That is a very logical way to develop the bishop. And now, of course, black should also continue with development and does so with the move knight to f6. At this point, white castles, black responds with castling. Very interesting middle game has developed. Uh, the pawn on d6 is a pretty big weakness. And what white should do here is play a move like bishop to f4, uh, just targeting it. It's incredibly difficult to protect. And normally, when you have a weak pawn like this, what you need to then do is create counterplay around that pawn. So perhaps you play a move like rook to e8 and then knight on e4, uh, or you play something like queen to b6. And the idea uh, is uh, maybe some counterplay over here. You, you, you need to find the points in white's position that are either not protected whatsoever or only protected with one thing. So b5 and b2 kind of down that line. Uh, white plays bishop g5. Again, I don't hate this move. Uh, white is following the, the philosophy of the 700s where if you make one move on one side, you need to do the exact same thing on the other side, which is why the bishops are both on the fifth rank. It's not good enough to go to bishop f4 because then you kind of break your own symmetry. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, Levy, I've watched three and a half minutes of this video and no one's done anything stupid, all right? I'm losing my attention span. Uh, and at that point, uh, to you, uh, I would respond, uh, I appreciate you watching three minutes. Uh, try to last a little bit longer than that. It will come in handy in other aspects of life than chess, um, but um, it, we're getting there. All right, it's like when you show up to watch a, a 100 minute movie, like the Avengers or something, they don't, the, the major fight scene doesn't happen in the first minute. Relax, we're doing character development at this point. Bishop to g5. I love this position, so what do we do now? We've got a potential weakness over here. Probably the best thing to do is to step out of this pin or target this bishop. So at this point, you wanna like identify the trades, like maybe h6 or a6. Queen a5, not a bad move at all. Laser beaming this way, hits the knight, hits the bishop, uh, but this pawn is just cleanly hanging. There is kind of something interesting here though. Remember I told you to target things that are only protected by one piece? Well, now you have this very nice idea, knight e4. And if knight takes, then you get the bishop. Could be interesting, I'm just saying, just the way for the game to develop. White takes on c6, and now we have our first official trade. Uh, white here plays queen d2. See, if white had just looked a little bit further, they would have realized that there is a pawn on d6 that's completely unguarded, but they play queen d2. And this is right around where the game begins. We have officially finished the appetizer portion of the meal, and now it is time for the entree, the main course. Be prepared to laugh, cry, feel disgusted, and everything in between. Rook to b8. Rook b8 is a relatively normal move, just attacking the weak pawn over here, 
and white just totally ignores it. But it kind of makes sense because, you know, you want to make this battery with queen and bishop, and oftentimes in King's Indian defense positions, you want to get rid of this bishop because if this were to happen, then this is kind of menacing for, for, for black. I mean, the knight is coming and everything, but this is still defended. But okay, knight to g4 is played. Let the fun begin. This attacks the bishop. Okay, so the bishop decides to take, king takes. And still, this is looming, and this is over here, and white plays queen to g5. I mean, you have to justify the movement of the queen to d2 in the first place, so you move the queen over here opposite the king. That looks a little bit scary. Now, the stronger players watching the video probably at this point have begun to realize, well, I can just, I can, I, I mean, I, I have this over here, so I can just take it and it's protected, and then maybe I'll take this pawn. Correct. But what if you don't take the queen and you just go for the free pawn? I don't want a queen trade. I prefer to blunder my queen in one move. But the person playing with the white pieces moved the queen over here to, men to be a menace to the king. And the queen needs a little bit of help to be a menace to the king. So here comes the knight. White does not take a full queen, rather moving the defender of their own queen out of the way, so now the queen can take them right back for free. But remember what was black's last move? Rook takes b2, so you gotta continue munching. Rook takes c2. One queen was hung, the second queen has been hung, and now the third queen hang in a row. Rook takes c2. Now, uh, at this point, white decides that even though they have a knight hanging, there is a queen over there and their own queen is hanging, that they are going to justify their actions by playing knight takes g6. Now, folks, I cannot stress enough that this move makes absolutely no sense. None. Because now white has a hanging knight, a hanging knight, and a hanging queen. That is 15 points of material that has absolutely no defense. But here, black plays rook to e8. Now that move is, that is a fascinating move, as the queens are just having an absolute staring contest here on the fifth rank, both hanging, no defense, just, <laughs> I see you, and I see you, but I can't move, because I can't move myself, it's all about the, the, the big person up there moving me, you know, we see each other. Okay, here, white goes, haha, I have one time of, so I'm, I'm gonna go back, I've, I've won some time, now you're in check. Now, what's fascinating here is I don't understand why black did not take with either pawn, because black clearly knows pawns can capture diagonally, because black did it over here. Black did not forget about this. So some moves later, black completely forgets how pawns move and chooses not to take. But okay, rook to e8, and now the queen is hanging for like a fifth or a sixth time. At this point, the queen hangs again, once again. It's not the black queen that's hanging, it's now the white queen that's hanging, uh, and the check has been given, so the king, of course, needs to move. Now, uh, after king to f8, white realizes that coming in with a knight again doesn't make any sense, and the only way to give a check to this king is to play the absolutely devastating move queen to h6. That is a fork, that is a triple fork, except for one problem, it's hanging the queen again. That is once again a hanging queen, it is just not guarded, it's not, it, yeah, that's bad. So, king to e7. Of course, it would have been quite funny here if the players decided to repeat moves after queen g5, king f8, queen h6, when the queen would have hung on both squares, but it would have been a repetition. King to e7, and now the queen is finally out of danger, and black also realizes that this knight is hanging, so black proceeds to take on c3. Now, black is winning uh, because black has an extra bishop. That obviously is a good thing, but white has what's called compensation because this king obviously is pretty weak. It's barely surrounded by any pieces, and... You know, white should probably bring the rooks or something, or, or bring the rook this way and, and try to open up the center of the board, uh, or give a check. White realizes that the queen here is not doing too much, so let's bring it back. Now, queen to f5 is a, it's a really interesting move, because it now hangs a piece, uh, the queen, to a third piece that black has. Our protagonist could have taken with the queen, could have taken with the knight, but proceeds to not see a hanging queen again. Here, black plays uh, just an exceptionally creative move, rook to c1. Now, I cannot stress enough why that move is so ludicrous. There are just two rooks that see it. It's like walking through traffic. I mean, it, it, this move, I cannot stress how little sense it makes, but it is a fascinating idea looking to confuse white because now this rook is hanging, that rook is under pressure, and bishop is still attacking the queen. Technically, it's a, it's a brilliant move. I mean, it probably makes white completely malfunction. Of course, the best move here for white is to play queen g5 check, and just go take that rook for free. 
but white justifies their earlier queen move and takes the knight because obviously black has left the knight hanging that that was a hanging knight not realizing that further down that diagonal is once again a full blunder of a queen although here it would be scientifically better not to take the queen but to throw in the zwitschenzuk in between move check that rook would get taken then you would go here because if you actually take the queen on g4 you would lose your rook um, but black justifies this and takes the rook in the corner, leaving this queen hanging once again. Um, and uh, the game here should proceed. The best move is once again, you need to give this check. right? You need to give this check to hit both so you can get back and be okay. But white goes, oh my gosh, they took my rook, so I need to take a rook back. Completely failing to realize that after queen takes c1, there is a looming back rank mate. The only way to stop it is to go here. So white resigned and our protagonist from Poland, David, was the winner of the Immortal Queens game derby played by the 700s, the world championship of 700s. Now, some say that the queen of white is hanging to this day. The queen never moved. It could have been triumphantly sacrificed, but white probably left this game going, whew, Good thing I never blundered my queen in this game. I blundered checkmate, but that queen will be immortalized in the annals of time as the queen that survived probably about seven or eight different captures. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I am enjoying watching your game submissions, ladies and gentlemen. Many of you are sending me some fascinating games. Some of you are sending me games that don't make any sense. You're asking me to analyze 70 move end games that you've played against people. That doesn't make any sense. All right, I am not a professor. I am a circus manager. That is my profession. And for the games that uh, are submitted, I want to educate you, but I also want to make you laugh. Some of these games have been absolutely fascinating to read through. I've never seen a game quite like this one. Um, the combined accuracy of both of these players was something like 20. So maybe 25. I'll see you in the next one. Get out of here.